Okay, hi, and welcome back to Great Text and Philosophy. We're talking about John Dewey's Art as Experience, Chapter 8, The Organization of Energies. Now, at the end of the previous chapter, Dewey introduced his theme, this theme of the organization of energies as a way of understanding the dynamic character of what he said, calls the unity in variety, the unity in variety that characterizes the work of art. Okay, so that's what he's told us this chapter is going to be about at the end of the last chapter. And certainly, in the last several chapters, we focused a lot on uh, what Dewey calls here the art product or the ob art object or the expressive object, right? Um, and uh, the conditions of its production and appreciation, but very much centered on the object or the product. At the beginning of this chapter, Dewey reminds us of the distinction he's drawn between the art product um, and uh, you know the statue, the painting, whatever, and the actual work of art, which is the pro what the product does in experience. Thus, uh, a significant part of the focus of this chapter concerns artistic perception and sort of the psychological aspect of all of this. Now, according to Tom Letty, Dewey gives us here at the very beginning of the chapter his own definition of art per se. Um, so, quoting Dewey from the very first paragraph, into the first paragraph, when the structure of the object is such that its force interacts happily, but not easily, with the energies that issue from the experience itself, when their mutual affinities and antagonisms work together to bring about a substance that develops cumulatively and surely, but not too steadily, toward a fulfilling of impulsions and intentions, then indeed there is a work of art. And Letty says this definition, um, like a definition of a later philosopher of art, Nelson Goodman, um, answers not what is art so much as when is art. When is an experience an example of a work of art? Um, and the importance of rhythm, which we've talked about before and in the last chapter, it's implicit here, right, in the discussion of mutual affinities and antagonisms, um, in the discussion of uh, the sort of cumulative movement towards fulfillment. Um, those, those notions of rhythm from previously are still, uh, are still at work. Now, um, it's easy to think about a musical piece as uh, an example of a work of art that has rhythm. Right in terms of the the repetitions in time uh, behind very the variations in the music and the melody and what have you, it's so easy to think about this kind of example that it leads to a mistake that Dewey is at pains here to disabuse us of, namely the mistake that the mistaken idea that rhythm is only a product of temporal arts in like music mu arts that play out in time whereas there is no uh, rhythm in spatial arts like painting and sculpture. Right? I mean, take this uh, painting by Van Gogh. Is there rhythm in this, in this painting? I mean, certainly I can uh, perceive complex um, symmetries and asymmetries, order and disorder of spatial arrangement in this painting of a sunflower or a pair of sunflowers, but uh, where's the rhythm, right? Okay. Now, but remember, Dewey, uh, according to Dewey, it's not the painting itself uh, or this reproduction of the painting in this video that is the work of art. This is only the art product, right? The, the work of art um, is what happens to the, uh, the product in perception um, or how it works in perception. So um, to crudely oversimplify the act of artistic perception. One views the work, right, with one perceptual apparatus, um, and this also uh, produces um, and goes along with motor responses. Um, and so there's that back and forth characteristic between the creature and the object. Um, I also have my immediate reaction to the work. Um, uh, you know, one has that surrender that Dewey talks about in the terms of the last chapter. Um, as well as reflection and discrimination uh, about the work. There's more intellectual appreciation, um, which also forms a rhythm, back and forth rhythm with the acts of immediate, or the, the element of immediacy in perception. And it's just in this whole 
complex process of perception that rhythm and dewey sense is a part of the work of art. So in these mistaken ideas of, of rhythm that focusing too much on the art product and on this distinction between the temporal and the spatial arts um, uh, creates, uh, one Dewey calls the TikTok theory. This is based on the idea that, that rhythm is literal recurrence in a me mechanical sense, like the, the TikTok of a clock over and over again, a metronome. In this case, would be an exam a keen example of rhythm, but that's not what Dewey means by rhythm. Um, Dewey also uh, uh, considers the idea that rhythm is concerned with the repetition of beats. Uh, he calls this the tom-tom theory and points at sort of tribal music as a, as an example. But Dewey here, uh, you know, reminds us that um, uh, that that tribal music or no kind of music just has a kind of drum beat by itself, absent other kinds of instruments dancing, variations of the, the drumming, and, and all sorts of things like that, right? So both of these are, are mistaken ideas about how exactly rhythm works. So Dewey tells us the identification of rhythm with literal recurrence, with regular return of identical elements, conceives of recurrence statically or anatomically um, instead of functionally. And there's that, that word function or functional Functionally, this is a common Deweyan theme. For the latter, that is the functional notion of rhythm, interprets recurrence on the basis of furtherance through the energy of the elements of a complete and consumatory experience. So this here sums up Dewey's notion of rhythm in perception as against the literal or mechanical recurrence theories as about the relation of elements in experience furthering the development uh, of the experience through time. And of course, rhythm in that sense is, uh, is part of the perception of any work of art, right? Any, any, um, any interaction with an art product, statuaries, uh, architecture, um, uh, painting, or music, or drama, or anything of that sort. Now Dewey uses the term objectivity again in this chapter in a, in a notable way, I think it's worth remarking on. So quoting Dewey, but the objective measure of greatness is precisely the variety and scope of factors which, in being rhythmic each to each, still cumulatively conserve and promote one another in building up the actual experience. Um, and so I think we need to ask ourselves here, what does Dewey mean by objective in this paragraph, by greatness, in fact? Um, it, it might seem like he's attempting to provide a kind of universal criterion for good versus bad art, right, in terms of this objective measure of greatness. But I'll remind you that Dewey's conception of objectivity is unusual. We talked a lot about that last time. Um, and uh, notably, when Dewey talks about objectivity, um, it includes elements uh, concerning experience and concerning individual reactions to a work of art uh, or any kind of situation which we would normally class as subjective, right? But for Dewey, object, you know, number one, experience takes place not sort of in the skull of the individual, but in the world, in the interaction between the, the live creature and the environment. Right, um, not just in the live creature by itself. And number two, um, objectivity here means um, not so much universal or um, material, uh, but just existing, right? Observable, perhaps, um, uh, uh, but not necessarily something that is totally um, um, sort of absolute, right? And indeed, um, uh, when Dewey talks about the greatness of the work of art, um, it's not the art product he's discussing, right? So it must include the perceiver as a term, right? Um, uh, because the work of art is precisely uh, what is happening in experience and perception. Um, also, in the following paragraph after this quote, Dewey in contrasts the term greatness with fineness, right? Um, 
this to me indicates that greatness um, uh, is a particular type of quality, not a sort of sole sort of measure of artistic value, but one of several good qualities of art. Uh, one, it can be great, it can be fine, not in the sense of it's fine, but uh, in the sense of fine art as opposed to um, you know, popular art or, or industrial arts or something like that. Um, we might also contrast great with classic from prior discussions. You know, a classic work is one that um, uh, sort of is fruitful in many people's experience across many different sort of times and cultures. Um, so what Dewey says here in this quote is that when the art product has a variety of different kinds of factors that interact uh, in different ways with the perceiver, such that despite that variety, there is rhythm, accumulation, a culmination in an experience, right? Uh, in an experience, I mean, that's the objective measure of greatness, right? If, if it fulfills those conditions, then it is a, the work of art is great, at least for that perceiver. So that's all I've got for today. Um, there, of course, are a lot of examples from poetry, literature, painting, and sculpture in the text this week. And uh, we'll discuss some of the, those examples, some of Dewey's examples, and whether or not and, and how they fit these ideas during class. So we're going to leave the examples for class. Um, I look forward to hearing what you think about this, and uh, if there are threads in the chapter I didn't follow, as there were many, uh, and always are, I'm eager to hear about them and hear what you think about those things as well. So I'll be reading the discussion boards, looking forward to talking to you in class, and also, you know, welcome to leave a comment on the video um, if you want to discuss some of those other aspects, uh, or, or tell me what you think about how I've, uh, how I've explained these other, these other elements, these, these elements that I was interested in. So uh, otherwise, have a great week, and I'll see you, uh, see you later.